Hi everybody, my name is Simon Timpoli from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to Food Safety Fridays. We've been away for a few weeks over the summer, but it's great to be back uh, with you. And today our special guest is Shell Hartzer, and the topic is going to be fly control in food processing. So welcome, Shell. Nice to have you back. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've just been saying that we've got 18... 117 registered for today 1817 which is huge so they've all come to see you. no pressure pressure's on i don't know if i can do this anymore <laughs> you love it really so yeah um well let's start by where are you joining us from today show i am outside of atlanta georgia atlanta georgia and i'm in the uk uh, near manchester uh, it's rainy today uh, it's probably sunny where you are is it shell no, it's kind of dark and dreary out there, oh. too. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll never second guess the weather. So tell us where you're joining from in the sidebar. Barbara from Melbourne, Australia. I don't know what time it is. Are you getting up or are you staying up late? I don't know, but they're all there to see you, Shell. So, right, I'm going to play the video ads now from our kind sponsors, and then we'll be back for the presentation. Food safety accidents are a real possibility these days meaning an increased scrutiny and rigorous testing on production and other areas. From farmlands to dining tables, each stage of the entire food supply chain is challenged by product safety, quality and effectiveness. Whether you're a grower, food packer, trader or hold any important role in the food supply chain, HQTS can help you to ensure quality and safety from the source. Our services include product inspections, safety audits, quality management, and consulting and training. HQTS, your partner in quality. Okay, let's get this show on the road. I'm going to disappear. I'll be back for the Q&A later, but for now I'll hand you over to Shell. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are turning in for. I see some familiar names on the list. I see a lot of familiar places. So thank you all for joining us. As I said, it's kind of a dark and dreary day here outside of Atlanta, Georgia, but we're going to brighten things up by talking about flies. So exciting today, and obviously some of you are excited because we have a lot of people registered. So the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, flies are a problem, uh, and, and not just because they're an insect and, and they're in your food plant or your warehouse or your food, whatever it is. There are 65 diseases that they've been tracked 
to have and and able to contaminate things with. And when you look at the picture that I've got there and, and the arrow, that's their mouth parts. And if you get really close on those mouth parts, you see how big they are and how much surface area and all the hairs all over their body that can pick up those contaminated particles and then transfer them to your nice clean surfaces inside your facility. So especially with large flies, we are very concerned about disease as well as the contamination issue. But we are also concerned about small flies. We didn't think that small flies were big on contaminating stuff, but go figure. Uh, this is a study that was done a few years ago, and they found out that uh, small flies, particularly the fruit fly, was capable of transferring E. coli, salmonella, and listeria. So once again, they're picking up those particles that are maybe in that dirty drain and they're transferring them to whatever they land on. So really important when you think of flies, it's not just a contamination issue. It's, it's not just this little thing flying around your plant. It is potentially disease transmitting. And of course, with that, um, terrible things can happen. <laughs> This is the part where, you know, we, we go through the horror stories. And I realize that this is not a food facility. This is a hospital. Um, but this was shut down. Operating rooms were shut down because of small flies. Um, and, you know, when this hits the news, your reputation can be destroyed because of this. I mean, who wants to go have surgery in a hospital that had to be closed down because of a pest problem? So, and of course... Uh, this can also happen in food facilities. So this is one I just pulled. Uh, this is from July 29th, so um, about a month or so ago. Um, and this particular facility was uh, cited by the FDA and sent warning letters, which is one step before being closed down by the FDA. And it again, you can see where all of FDA investigators observed over 100 flies in their milk parlor area. That's That's not good. So we have federal oversight. You may have audits that are at your facility. All of these reasons are why flies need to be controlled. Okay. And of course, as with any pest, we're talking about an integrated system. We're talking about using multiple methods to try and get to the root of that problem and eliminate it. Now, that's a lot easier said than done. As you can see from my little graphic here, everything is twisted up and connected. And if you don't do one thing, that affects something else. And if you do one thing wrong, it's going to affect something else. So we talk about this in these nice, pretty categories, but it is complicated. And it is one of those things that sometimes we don't have all the tools and we have to we have to realize that and work with that. Now, I'm not going to go through identification of all the, the large flies and small flies we deal with. There are plenty of good resources out there for you to look up, um, you know, get some pictures, give it to your local entomologist or great resources online. So we're not going to go through that. But what I will say is it is important to identify what species you're dealing with, because that leads to where they might be. What food source might they be on? Where, where are they coming from? So we have to get that identification right, because if we don't, we can really waste a lot of time and wind up with a lot of problems. So quick example for you, um, I was dealing with a, a facility that had small flies and they said it's it's fruit flies. We're dealing with fruit flies. We've been dealing this. We, we keep treating everything. We keep doing everything we're supposed to be doing. And we still have fruit flies. And I said, are you sure? Because that's always my first question. Who identified it? Um, and they said, we're, we're sure, we're absolutely sure. Um, and of course, you know, fruit flies, are, our main area of concern a lot of times is drains or fruits and vegetables if they're there. But this was, so they had treated the drains, they'd cleaned the drains, they'd gone through all of this work. And what we came to find out, it wasn't a fruit fly. This is a fungus gnat. And fungus gnats typically come from overwatered soil. And when you went into their office areas where they had a whole bunch of pretty plants, this is actually where they were coming from. So that correct identification immediately puts us to where we should start looking and we don't waste time and energy somewhere else. So in this case, um, we actually took all the potted plants out to start with and then slowly started bringing them back in as we as we knew what what was going on there. So really important to get that identification correct. Because as I said, 
that leads to inspection. Where do we start looking? Where, where are these things going to be found? What conducive conditions? What, what food are they after? Where are those problems? And they could be in a lot of different places. Again, with fruit flies, we may have fruits or vegetables. Um, we have moth flies and forage flies often coming from drains. Our large flies are typically going to be coming from the outside. So again, we can focus our efforts with that inspection. Ideally, you want to inspect everywhere, but realistically, we're not going to be able to inspect everywhere. So let's find it as fast as we can so we can start dealing with the problem. As I mentioned, uh, large flies typically coming from outside. They're breeding outside. They, they love that, that decaying organic material. Maybe it's, it's a dead animal that's out there. Maybe it's that disgusting dumpster bin that's, that's there and it's the disgusting. Um, they're typically breeding in those outside areas. That's where the larvae are. That's where the eggs are. The adults get into food facilities. They come in through the open door. Small flies, on the other hand, small flies are, are typically breeding inside. It's in a drain. It's on a food source. It's typically coming from inside the facility, which again, even if we can identify down to, is it a large fly or a small fly, we can start that inspection process and we can start to know where we're going to look. Of course, sanitation has a lot to do with this. Our inspection should show us where those sanitation issues are because those sanitation issues are where the flies are. Especially with small flies, everybody will tell you small flies are a sanitation issue, which is great, but how do you eliminate all the food from a food facility? You know, you have to deal with this. There, there are gonna be some dirty drinks every once in a while. There, there is gonna be food waste. There is food going through the processing line. There's food being stored. So you have to find those sanitation issues, where they're breeding, where they're most likely to be, and do the best you can to hopefully clean that up or find some other way to mitigate it. Now I mentioned small flies inside, so I've got a picture, a couple pictures here of some pretty disgusting looking drains. Um, this happens, again, you're a food facility, you're processing food. But with small flies, this also provides their habitat. They are protected in that gunk, in that buildup. So they have all that protection. And remember that, because we're gonna come back to that in just a minute. Sanitation with the large flies I mentioned is typically coming from the outside. There is a dumpster, there is a dead animal, there is feces, there is something that they are using as their food source and their breeding source. And then the adults, we mentioned that disease and how much surface area they have. They pick up particles of dead stuff, decaying stuff, feces, and then they fly into your facility and then they can drop those particles. So, you know, finding the breeding sources outside can be easy, especially when we see a, a dumpster like this. We know that that's going to be a problem. But in a lot of cases, especially some that I deal with with large flies, it's because of a neighbor. Maybe there's a feedlot next door or maybe there's a, a farm on the other side. Um, I, I dealt with a facility that had a recycling plant literally next door to it. So sometimes we have to get creative, especially when it's not on your property, but we can do that. So again, even if you can just differentiate, this is going to be a small fly coming from inside, this is going to be a large fly coming from outside, you've really gotten closer to that source. And of course, we want to keep them out, particularly, I mean, small flies are typically coming from the inside, so we'll come back to that. But with our large flies, I mean, let's keep them on the outside where they belong. We don't want these open doors. We don't want these gaps. Anything, is, especially around doors, I like to stand inside. And if you can see daylight around that door, anywhere you look, and you have to, you have to get down sometimes to see that the bottom, stuff is going to get in, okay? So maybe that door isn't sealed right. Maybe that door isn't closing correctly. It does look like it's got a good seal on the bottom, so we don't have to worry about that. But the rest of it, we may have a dumpster that's right outside this doorway. And the flies are just like, okay, I'm going to go this way. And they get into the facility. So finding those gaps and going back to your inspection, where were those conducive conditions and sealing the areas closest to that first? I mean, you don't want to seal your front door of, of the office area 
when the dumpsters on the other end of the building and there's a bunch of dock doors that aren't sealed. You want to seal that area first. So consider where your conducive conditions are and then work outward from that when you start sealing stuff. And do not forget the roof. We, we tend to look at eye level or below. We, we look down or we, we look at eye level. There are a lot of things that could get in on the roof level, including flies. So please inspect your roof a couple times a year at least so that we're not pulling flies or not letting them come in from the outside from that aspect. And maybe we can't seal up right away. Maybe, maybe it's going to take a week to get to this door. Well, we're going to put some extra monitors in there, right? We're going to see which doors, which areas by where our monitors are placed, see where those hot spots are and address those areas first. All right. This is the other issue that we see quite a bit. Doors are just left open. Not, not that they're not even being sealed. I mean, they're just they're just left open. So we have to address this. And this is obviously an employee issue. And we have to explain to the employees of why doors need to be closed. I mean, with something like this, we're, we're not only inviting the flies in because I'm sure it smells great with all the food that you have in there, but we're also inviting the rats and the mice and every other pest out there to literally walk in the door. So a little bit of an education on why why we need to to close these doors, why we need to do this. And um, yeah, comment there about um, air curtains. Um, you know, air curtains have to be very carefully installed. They're not the best option. But if there's something like this where a door is literally never going to get closed, it could help some. So we do have a couple methods. Maybe we could put a screen on that door if it's got to stay open. But that education of the employees of why these doors need to stay closed, that can help significantly because this, it's, it's wide open. You are literally putting an open sign over that door saying, please come in. And we don't want that. We want to keep those large flies on the outside and keep their diseases and their everything on the outside. I mentioned monitors, so we do absolutely have some monitors for both small flies and large flies. You are probably most likely to see light traps, insect light traps, and this is both a monitoring device and a control device. So there's usually a sticky board behind there. Some of these are electrocution models. Usually don't suggest those when it's around food. The, the glue boards are a much, much better idea from that. Um, so the fly you know, is attracted to that light output gets in there, gets stuck on the glue board. So you have eliminated that fly. But you also get to monitor now. What type of fly is that? Large fly? Small fly? How many are on that glue board? Are we seeing an increase? Are we seeing a decrease? Did somebody just leave that door open again overnight? And now we've got tons of flies there. These will not catch everything, okay? So while it is a trap, you have to use it also as a monitor to, to evaluate, to let it tell you a story of what's going on there so that then you can write the ending to that story and you can do the, the corrective action that needs to happen so that we get those numbers back down. And I have on there, you know, how often should they be checked? Uh, there is an audit standard that says, I believe, every two weeks during the summer and every and monthly during the winter months. Uh, my recommendation usually for food facilities is just go ahead and check them at least every two weeks. Uh, depending on the risk level that you have, depending on the foods that you are producing, you may want to check it weekly. And that's fine, too. But minimum of every two weeks, because we, we want to see those changes and we want to react quickly when there is that change, when there is that increase. If we wait another two weeks to do something, those flies have had two weeks to increase their populations and do what they need to do. Now, I will say with insect light traps, they are a little bit better for the large flies. Small flies don't fly very well and fly very far. So if you start seeing small flies show up on one of your insect light traps, the source is pretty close to that. But they won't fly all the way across the food facility to get to that light. So really, you're going to see a lot more large flies on the insect light traps there. And of course, we have to make sure they're working correctly. 
Um, I, I have pictures of, you know, the traps and the light traps and all this stuff here. It is not a recommendation on any specific models. I'm just using these as examples. Um, lots of good models out there. But this particular one, we have two dead light bulbs in there. If we have two dead light bulbs out of three, this is not working very well. It's not, it's not got the same pull that, that, that light output is going to pull those flies in. So we have to make sure that these are serviced just like any other control device, any other monitoring device that we have in the facility. We want to make sure that these are checked regularly. Like I said, at least every two weeks, depending on, on what's going on there. We have to make sure those bulbs are changed yearly. Those bulbs lose effectiveness. So even though you still see that bright green light, after about nine, 12 months, they've really lost a lot of, of that, that output. So we need to change the bulbs at least yearly. And we need to make sure they're working. One of the things that I see uh, I definitely over the last few years, I'd say the last five years, um, I start seeing a lot of uh, insect light traps that are unplugged. Why are they unplugged? Because somebody wanted to charge their cell phone or their iPad. Um, so they unplugged it. So this device was doing absolutely no good um, if it's unplugged. So if you're installing these, if you're placing these, uh, be careful of where that electricity is and where these need to be and make sure there's a little sign that says do not unplug under any circumstances so that they do their job. Again, not recommending or dissing any light traps. There, there are lots of good ones out there. As I mentioned, these are a monitoring device. These tell us a story of what's going on. You know, we can do inspections. Maybe you have an outside, a, a third party that does your pest control, or maybe you have an in-house team that's doing your pest control, but they're not doing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. These monitoring devices, the insect light traps, um, these are 24-7, these are assuming that they're plugged in, assuming that the light bulbs work. They're giving us that full picture, that full story to add to our inspections. So looking at this one, um, you know, we, we have to go back to identification again. What are we dealing with here? Well, we see a couple large flies, a um, couple of the, the bottle flies there, which may indicate some feces or a dead animal outside. But if we just took a quick look at this and said, okay, yeah, we've got small flies. Well, actually, if you look a little closer, those are ants. Those are winged ants. So we have an ant colony that's doing very well that they're producing all those reproductives and it's outside. So again, we're looping back and intersecting all of these things. All right, time for the fun stuff. We're going to talk pesticides. Now, pesticides against flies, read the label, pick something appropriate. They have a limited use. Remember that our small flies are, you know, contained, you know, we're going to see them near the food source. Our large flies are coming from outside. So what pesticide are we going to use on the inside if most of our population is outside or there's only a few adults flying around here? So this is where it gets tricky of choosing the right control method. And again, we're going to loop back to inspection, sanitation and identification. Uh, I would recommend uh, if you don't have it already, if you are an audited account, uh, you need to have an approved pesticide list so that nothing that is not allowed in the facility, not allowed to be used, isn't used. And this is uh, part of the major audit standards. So if you are BRC, SQF, AIB, um, you need to have that approved pesticide list. And we're talking again, where, where can they be where used? Where should they be used? And we're going to talk about that efficacy thing. Essentially, what it boils down to is the same, the same thing that you're going to look at for pesticides for any pest that's out there. You want to try and target it. You want to try and get it as close to them, as close to the source as you can. Because if we can get to that source, we can get to that root cause, we can eliminate the problem. Now, again, not always completely possible. So how do we minimize that as much as possible? So limited use in food facilities, we have fogs and sprays and those have to contact. So those little droplets of water, those, those little particles of the fogging have to contact the fly in order to knock it down. Or there's some with a little bit of residual. So it, 
gets on the wall, the fly lands on the wall, the fly can get knocked down. Again, we're talking the adults. So if we knock down a few adults, are we really doing a good job? Have we really addressed the problem? Um, I will definitely recommend if you are gonna do a spray or a fog to knock down some of those populations, insect growth regulators are a great addition. They're gonna extend the life of your treatment basically, um, particularly with, with small flies. If we're treating outside, where are our large flies coming from? Typically from the outside. So if we're doing those outside treatments, you know, maybe we're using a spray, maybe we're using like a granular bait, something like that, or a bait station. Again, if we can get an insect growth regulator in there, that is going to be really helpful and kind of extend the life of that treatment and do just a little bit better. Now, control, but you know, pesticides again, they're part of the program. They, again, if, if we've got a lot of flies in a facility, knocking down as many of the adults as we can, it's perfect, it's great, it's what we wanna do. Everybody will tell you that flies, particularly small flies, are a sanitation issue. So clean up all the sanitation issue and you've gotten rid of your flies, which sounds really nice and easy. But as all of you know, because you work in food facilities or deal with food facilities, cleaning is so hard. I mean, you're producing food, so there's always going to be waste. Uh, if you do any wet processing, there's always going to be stuff flushing down those drains. There's going to be equipment that, that stuff piles up behind that you just don't always get. Um, there may be something inside the equipment. I, I dealt with a bakery one time that had... Um, had processing equipment that came off World War II ships. Equipment that old was not designed for sanitation. <laughs> so these mixers were, were ancient and they, they still worked perfectly, but not designed for sanitation. So anybody who stands up in front of you and just says, just do sanitation and all your problems go away, you know, that's, it doesn't work like that. I mean, it does if we were in a perfect world but we're in the real world. So if we can lose the gunk, lose that buildup, lose that organic material, wherever it is, again, I've, I've got a picture of a drain here, but I, I mean, in the bakery situation, it was within the motor casing, um, in the motor housing that that gunk was building up. So we wanna try and get rid of as much of this as possible because the larvae are inside of that. They're protected inside of all that gunk. So you may get one or two, you know, if you use a pesticide, you may get like one or two that's kind of near the surface, but the rest of them are like, we're in our little sleeping bags. We're all comfortable here. Nothing's happening to us. And then they come out later and there's no pesticide left. So they survive. So as much of this as we can get rid of, as often as we can, for most of our small flies, they have about a seven day development period. So when that adult lays that egg, it's got seven days before it comes out as an adult and starts the process all over again. So you can use that life cycle information as your timing. We don't have to clean the drains every single day. I mean, you can if you want to, I'm not gonna stop you from doing it every single day, but maybe we can just do it every, every week and knock down that gunk, and then we've knocked down those larvae, and we've eliminated the majority of the problem. So think about timing as you come into this as well. Uh, no, next slide, there we go. Um, so lots of options here. Again, most times, a lot of times, our small flies are coming from drains. They, they get that buildup. There's all that, I keep calling it gunk, but there's all that organic buildup in there that they're surviving in. So cleaning those drains, particularly with a foaming cleaner, because that foam sticks and slowly breaks down all that material so it can flush down. If you're using a liquid, make sure to get it all the way around that drain. You can't just dump it down the drain because, again, you've missed most of that. So trying to get as much of that material as you can, which is why the foaming cleaners are especially good. Uh, the picture that I have down there on the bottom left, I mentioned that they're not always coming from drains. In this case, we have a, a large piece of equipment that we can't move, but we know that the flies are coming from behind it because we've done our monitoring. So if we get the foam back there, 
get that material back there, get it cleaned, get it knocked down, we can eliminate a lot of that problem. I mentioned that small flies are usually an inside problem. I'll give you the one example I ran into when they were not. This is, um, this is actually outside. This is underneath a dock plate. And this area was getting a lot of rain and there was a lot of mess underneath that dock plate. So we were having a small fly issue. And not only were they coming from the outside, but they were coming up through that dock plate and actually around through the ill-fitting dock door that was there. So um, think creatively sometimes. When we talk about those inspections and finding those drains, finding those spots, if you don't find it in where you expect to, start circling outwards, start broadening those horizons. Where is the wet, moist, organic material? And use your monitors as well. Where, where are they all showing up? Are they showing up in the, in the insect light trap that's by that dock door? Or are they showing up in the insect light trap that's in your office? That narrows it down so you can start cleaning those areas first and then again, work your way out. We, want, we may want to make sure that these drains absolutely positively get done every week. But we may have some drains in the warehouse side that there's nothing in there. They're fine. So maybe we don't have to do those. Maybe we can do those once a week or once a quarter. Again, look at those populations and see what's going on there. There we go. I mentioned that sanitation is not easy. Uh, I mentioned some old equipment that we were dealing with. In this particular situation, we were having a pretty bad small fly issue. Um, this was a, a dry processing site, but they did washdowns of the floor. And of course, with all the, the flour and the, the dry material that they were using, we had wet organic material. And the floor, because this was a much older facility, the floor had kind of shifted. So nothing nothing went straight to the drain anymore there were there were puddles and so did the best we could you know made sure that we that that they squeegeed that water towards the drain but there were a couple areas that just they just remained bad we talked about exclusion and keeping these things out you can also think about exclusion and keeping them in what happened in this particular situation is we had this one area that was just really bad. I mean, we knew that it was coming from there. We really couldn't do anything about the sanitation. We had tried. We didn't want to continuously do treatments again and again and again. So what we did is we actually built a plastic wall over that area. And so what happened is there were still small flies in there, but they were contained in there. They weren't getting out into the larger processing area. So our exclusion in this case was keeping them contained to one single area where we could deal with them much easier. So exclusion isn't just keeping the outside out. Sometimes it's segmenting different areas so that these things can be more contained and more easily done. I mentioned, you know, with, with sanitation, with those drains, do what you can and address the biggest problems first. You know, if we have a drain that's to the side that's not very dirty and we know that flies aren't coming out of it, we don't have to deal with that right now. Let's deal with the stuff where we know it is. Focus on those top issues, those top places that are causing problems so that you can then work your way out. Oops, let's try the next button. There we go. And with this, uh, I mentioned audits briefly, but, uh, you know, in the U.S., we have good manufacturing practices. Depending on where you are in the world, you have something similar. You have audit standards that come into play, AIB, SQF, BRC. You may have federal standards that, that apply to this. But really, this is all part of good manufacturing practices of protecting your food, protecting your process, protecting the people that are going to eat this, the end users. So we can see that pest control is actually part of this. I mean, right there, pest control is a, a part of this. But then you look at some of those other parts of good manufacturing practices and you realize there's the overlap. There's the sanitation, sanitary facilities and clothes, cleaning and sanitizer, cleaning and sanitizing, building sanitation. Okay, so all of these things are part of pest control in a way. Now you're not, again, if you have a third party or a group that does the pest control, you may not be the one who's actually doing the sanitation. However, 
you know, you may be overseeing the group that needs it, or you may be getting the information of where these sanitation issues are. That then will help to go to minimizing your fly populations. Um, and pest control, again, includes the outside of your facility. That is, that's where most of our large flies are coming from. So we have to address those if that's going to be an issue. And there's a lot of communication that goes into this. Um, I really haven't talked too much uh, about who's doing the pest control. Many facilities, particularly in the U.S., will have a third party doing the actual pest control work. Um, some sites still have an internal team that may be doing that. So whether, whether you have farmed it out, whether you are using a third party or you have an in-house program, it is about communication between that team and everybody else. Everybody else needs to remember to close the doors, to look for sanitation issues, to report these things. So one way or another, service reports should be being generated. Again, whether it's a third party or an in-house team, you should have documentation of what was done. And think about the timing of these inspections. Are they just looking at the traps on the wall, the insect light traps? Are they actually looking around and looking for those dirty drains and inspecting? You know, time should be spent on that inspection process as well as checking the traps. But it has to intersect, it has to overlap because you could just check the, the traps, check the insect light traps and say, okay, we've got a couple flies, but it's not too bad. The door sealed okay. But you've completely missed all the small flies that are coming from the drains nearby because they're not on the insect light trap. So that inspection has to happen and that needs to be on those service reports. You should also have quarterly, you know, checkups. Again, whether that's the outside company that sends maybe a manager um, or if for your internal team, somebody else does the, the, the inspections for a day to just kind of check on how things are working. And of course, if you're following any of the audit standards, you need an annual facility assessment. And this is this is like your story of what's gone on this this past year. You know, what had you found? What did you do? And then what do you plan on doing next year? So this this is your story, this annual facility assessment of your year's worth of pest control. You have to have all that paperwork in order. None of us like doing all this paperwork, but it has to be done. Again, particularly if you are in the U.S. or, you know, in, in any facility that is going to be audited. Also, take a look at your licenses. Uh, in the U.S. and many other countries, you need to be licensed to do pest control. Um, is that license still active? Has it expired? Um, we want to make sure that everything is up to date and where we need it to be. We also may want to think about escalation policies, and this is when there's a problem. There's there's that dirty drain, and we've said something, we've documented it, we've written it down for weeks, for months, and there's still a fly problem there because nobody's taking care of it. So who's the next person that you can go to to say, hey, this problem hasn't been taken care of. What do we do about it? So think about that escalation process so that these things can get done. Maybe there's a reason that drain hasn't been cleaned, but we have to know that. And again, that has to go on these reports. There we go. Which brings us back to IPM. It all overlaps. And I gave you some examples of what happens when sometimes we can't do something. We can't do sanitation. We can't do exclusion. It does get tricky. And so in those cases, you have to think about all the other tools and use those a little bit more. If we can't get that door closed, okay, can we set up more insect light traps to capture the things that are coming in? If we can't do sanitation in that area, can we build that wall to keep them on that side and keep them out of our product? If we can't do an inspection on an area, sometimes that happens that we have an area that we just can't get into or can't get behind machinery, whatever it is. Maybe we put that on a regular cleaning schedule to get that foaming cleaner up there and just get rid of anything that could be there. Or maybe we use more monitors to tell us what's going on in that area. 
all of these things overlap and it's not perfect and you will never have a perfect system. You will never be able to have perfect sanitation. You will never be able to have perfect exclusion. The doors need to open and close. You need to bring in that product. You need to send your product out. You need to process the food. So there's going to be waste. There, there's going to be food waste in trash containers and food waste in drains and all those places. So think about the process and think about what you need to do if it can't be perfect, if you can't address all of these things, because even though it's not perfect, there's usually still things that you can do to at least minimize the problem to a point that it's OK and it's safe and we're not going to have things spreading any kind of disease around. And remember, too, that everybody is responsible for pest management. You, if you have a sanitation team, that sanitation is helping with the pest problem. It's reducing that food source. It's reducing the habitat, the gunk that they have have lived in. Um, a sanitation team is also, you know, cleaning up maybe some of the stuff from outside. Yeah, we've got dirty dumpsters that need to be cleaned on occasion. Otherwise, we're going to get those large fly infestations. Um, you know, you may have a maintenance team. They're in charge of exclusion. They're in charge of fixing those doors that the flies are coming in, communicating with them and making sure that they know no daylight. If you can see daylight, the door isn't sealed well enough. Go back and do it again. Everybody has a part to play, especially with inspection. Everybody's got two eyes. I hope everybody's got two eyes. They can be looking for these things. Do they know who to tell? when they start seeing a bunch of large flies? Do they know who to tell when they see a really dirty drain and some little, little maggots crawling out of it? So use everybody at your site, a little bit of education, letting them know what to look for and who to tell about it can stop these things from being massive infestations and can keep them just little small problems that are much easier to deal with because the pesticides are not going to be great. They are kind of a stopgap. They can be used and they can be effective, just not as effective as we have for some of the other pests. So consider your use of pesticides and again, adjust that and realize that the expectation with these pesticides is typically that it's gonna knock down the adults. It's not gonna do anything for the other life stages. And again, we have to think outside. Uh, this is a picture I took, um, had, a, had a chipmunk that, um, got taken out in my yard. Um, so very slowly, you could see the flies start to start to gravitate to that. And it was within minutes, uh, within minutes of, of me taking this out of a trap that the flies were, were already starting to go for that. So if something is dead out there and you start seeing these flies, you can easily, well, hopefully you can get rid of it pretty quickly so that those developing larvae now that are on that don't get into, don't get to adults and then get into your facility and keep re redoing that process. Because as this breaks down, there's lots of nasty pathogens and viruses and bacteria that are on this dead animal that these flies are gonna pick up on their legs, on their mouth parts and move inside. So don't forget about the outside as well. If you do that identification and you, you know, even divide it up into small flies or large flies, that gets you to the target, that gets you to the space where they're gonna be. And if you can address that, you've addressed the larvae and you can often eliminate those problems. So with that, I wanted to leave enough time for questions, which it looks like it did, yes. Uh, you can find me, uh, there is my email address, my website, you can find me on LinkedIn. I think I am the only shell heartser on LinkedIn. I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. So you might learn more about small flies in the coming week or large flies in the coming month. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, I know that we've got a lot of people on and I'm sure we've got a lot of questions. So if for some reason uh, we don't get to your question, feel free to email me. I'm gonna leave this up for, for another minute here so that you can take down my email. You can always contact me through my website as well or LinkedIn, um, any of those things. I am happy to, to talk about those things. And you know, this was 45 minutes of talking about flies. We literally could have talked for four hours on these. I, I have just given you the highlights of some of this stuff out there. But with that, um, Simon, we got questions? We do. Have you got answers, Shell? Well, we'll find out. 
Okay, we can only try. Um, right, so the first question is from Lalit Kumar. How much standard airflow is required for air curtains to avoid fly entry? Oh, as much as possible. Um, I, I don't have a number for you, but remember that that air curtain is usually posted up high, like on the top of the door. So as it comes down, it loses that velocity. And by the time you get to the bottom, there's usually not a lot of, of that push left. So depending on the fly, you know, that might get in sort of underneath the curtain, if you will. Um, but you need to, you need to always check the output and make sure that that stays on and make sure it's very directional as well. They have to be set up very carefully. So as much of that airflow as you possibly can get, get it. Okay, good. Uh, okay. From, uh, Lalit Kumar again, uh, what color is fly repellent? That oh, very good question. Um, I don't know that any colors are really repellent. However, with house flies and specific and some of the other large flies, um, the medium blue color, like not not a royal blue, but but not a navy blue, that that kind of middle blue color is very attractive to flies, which is why when, when we do fly traps, sometimes we're going to paint them that that medium blue color to attract them. But I'm not sure. And we got we got Stuart Mitchell on the line too. Stuart, if, if you know what did if anybody has any research on which colors are unattractive, um, dump that in the chat for me. Okay. So uh, who's Stuart Mitchell then? Just uh, Stuart into. Mitchell is a colleague of mine and he does a lot of fly work. So. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Stuart. Uh, thanks for your input in the sidebar there. Uh, okay. Um, question from Tariq. Uh, how long have uh, do it? What's the frequency of uh, changing uh, light tubes inside the light traps? Yeah, typically we do it yearly. As I said, they usually last about nine months ish. So you want to do it first thing in the spring, you know, and, and get that population. And then, you know, as you go through the summer, those high points and then, you know, towards winter, as that light output starts to fade, it's OK because, you know, you don't have high population. So aim for once a year and do it first thing in your spring. And uh, another question from Lalit Kumar. What is the light intensity of fly catches? It differs between what um, which bulbs you have in there and which style of light trap. So you can usually find that on the manufacturer's website, depending on which one it is. But it, it will vary a bit. OK, uh, question from Hamid. Um, is it possible to put the fly swatter above the manufacturing line with taking adequate care and performing the appropriate risk assessment? A fly swatter? Um, you're probably going to have to explain what you mean just a little bit better there. But, um, you know, a, a much better option is some kind of sticky trap, something that is going to contain them because we don't want even dead ones to fall into that food supply. So think of anything that you can do to either push them away from those processing lines or get them stuck on something. Yeah. Uh, okay. Question from Loriana. Uh, how to control fruit flies that are not associated with the sanitation problems, but rather are, are attracted to stored fruit or vegetables? At the home, at home, I've we've had so many fruit flies. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable! Yeah. They they seem to like just spontaneously generate, um, yeah. but they don't. Um, they they don't. So with fruits and vegetables, and I'm assuming that you have a, a large fruit and vegetable storage. This isn't just your your kitchen counter. Um, anything that you can do to contain those, um, you know, put them in bins or, or something that contains them a little bit better um, to keep the, those flies out. Because what, what's happening is they are attracted. The, the sanitation issue is some kind of decaying fruit or vegetable in there. Trust me, you, you've got something in there. They're, they're never perfectly all good. So some some type of building, some type of containment to to keep them out. And with small flies too, they don't fly very well. So sometimes even putting fans, directional fans, um, to push them away can be a significant help. 
Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, question from Alta. Oh, disappeared. I've, I'll have to move on to the next one. Uh, question from Michael. <clears throat> in summer, with increased humidity, we get a lot of flies in Africa. How does one get rid of flies in this kind of weather? Yeah, and, you know, again, sanitation, if you can, I'm guessing from where where you probably are in Africa, that's that's not an option. Um, any type of traps, um, especially if you can get, uh, one of the things that we do is we, we build kind of blue circular traps and on, drill holes around it so the flies can get in. And then on the inside, we, we paint it with insecticides. So the flies are attracted to that, they go in, they die inside that. Um, you can also target spray around doors and windows where they're likely to land um, and knock them down that way so those are those are two options for you uh janelle's just said uh, my home remedy is a bowl or container with vinegar covered with shrink wrap and with small holes it works yeah and there's even like little light traps like plug-in light traps with a little glue glue trap behind it there, there's a bunch of ways that you know you can minimize them in your home yeah uh question from Alison, can you give any advice for the control of ants in a bakery? Yep. First of all, figure out what type of ants they are, because um, that, again, leads you to the food source, leads you to where they are. Chances are they are outside. So if you can find the mound, find their, their colony, treat that colony. Um, otherwise, find out where they're coming in and seal up that area. Are they particularly difficult ants? Oh. Depends on species. Like some species will actually kind of get inside and nest inside, but most of them um, are outside and they're just foraging in. So find find the trail, steal off that point, and then right. try and deal with the colony. Okay, question from, oh, I, it's, I'm not sure it's a question really, but uh, Abdallah, in my hotel kitchen, I always have a problem with small flies linked to onions and potato storage yes. containers. Yeah, onions and potatoes are big ones for fruit flies. So what I would recommend, especially on that and for anything food wise, remember FIFO, first in, first out. So if we're constantly turning over that product, we give it less time to be infested and less time to have that issue. So first in, first out. Okay, question from Jerome. Uh, what if the area is too bright to attract flies to the UV light traps? Any, any other equipment recommended? You must have some really bright lights in your facility. I want to find out what you're doing. <laughs> um, other recommendations, I would say, where are they coming from? Can we put some sticky traps that are near those areas? Can we do extra sanitation? Um, are they coming from outside that we can do some extra exclusion? So depends on the type of fly that you have. Um, but yeah, you know, we can work around that. If you want to contact me afterwards, we can go through some more solutions and you can tell me more about that. Okay. Um, Lou, yellow color is good for plant soil living flies. Yes. You'll see that a lot in, in greenhouses because the fungus gnats and even aphids and, and things like that. Yes. Those flies like yellow. We, I don't think we see that as much with uh, the flies, the fruit flies, the fungus, gnat, sorry, not the fungus, gnat, the fruit flies, the forward flies and the moth flies. I don't think we see that preference as much. Okay. Question from Nuha. How does the air curtain work to eliminate flies? Is it to be installed at the entrance? Should it face inside the facility or towards the outside? Yeah, definitely. It's Think of it as a curtain. You know, think of, think of hanging up a shower curtain over a door. This is an invisible curtain of air. So it's not eliminating the flies. It's hopefully keeping them out. And yes, it should be pointed outwards because we want to, we want to make sure that that, that, doesn't get in and we push things out from that point. Okay. Uh, next one. How is a uh, question from Mauro. How is the number of catch on the fly table, the number in each little square? How to, basically, how do you count flies? Uh, yeah. If you have a lot, um, you can randomly pick a, a square because the the glue boards are, are usually gridded so 
instead of counting every little, little last thing on there, if there's a ton of it, you can randomly take a couple squares. As long as you remain consistent on that time and time again, as you, as you do these counts week after week, month after month, um, pick those squares. Because honestly, what's stuck to the glue board, I mean, if we have a hundred small flies stuck to the glue board, how many small flies does that mean we have in the drain? It's it's always going to be an estimate. It's never going to be a like a real number. So as long as you're consistent and pick your squares, go for it. Okay, thanks. Uh, question from Anna: Is it okay to fumigate maize flower processing unit? If yes, after how long and what kind of pesticides okay. to use? <clears throat> um, it depends. Uh, if we are taking fumigation, we're talking gassing. Yes, uh, in most countries, I will say. Um, in the U.S., we have uh, sulfurofluoride. And depending on the storage, you said processing. So um, sulfurofluoride would be the option here. If it's just storage, we can use phosphine sometimes. And how long depends on the temperature, actually. Uh, the warmer the temperatures are, the less time you have to hold that gas. Okay. Uh can you explain what the difference is between fruit flies and mold fly? This is where we get into a lot of trouble because there are a lot of common names for these small flies. Um, to my knowledge, in the U.S., there is no such thing with a common name as a mold fly. So um, I'm going to go through real quick fruit flies. Uh, fruit flies are typically on fruits, vegetables, like, like we said earlier, onions and potatoes. Forage flies are typically on dead decaying material. Uh, forage flies are often a problem in mausoleums, um, but those are the ones a lot of times in drain. And then we have moth flies, um, which have fuzzy little wings. I think they're actually kind of pretty. And those a lot of times are, are coming from drains as well. So, those, you know, you can look it up on Google too and find some, some other differences. Okay, question from Safa. How many times should I check ILT? Um, yep. Uh, um, like I said, minimum, if you're in a food processing facility, minimum of, of every, every other week, every two weeks. Okay. Uh, Bacola, how, can you recommend any drain cleaners that can help with organic buildup while killing the small flies? Yeah, it depends on where you live as to what products you have available. But if you have it available, something that's going to foam or that you can mix a foaming agent into. And a lot of times some of the cleaners have have the little um, microbes, the, the bacteria that can help to break down. It's the good bacteria that helps to break that down. So, uh, you know, research what you have in your area and see if you can get that foaming cleaner and see if you can get that enzymatic action. Okay. Uh, Javier, yes, you will be getting a copy of the video recording of this webinar and the slides afterwards. So don't worry. Um, question from Ia Bosola. Uh, which is the most effective for EFK, gummy type or buzzy type? <laughs> Yeah, so in food facilities, I would recommend the gummy type. That's the one with the glue board behind it. Um, because again, you want it to stick to the board. You, the, the, the buzzy type, the electrocution can sometimes, you know, buzz it off the trap and where does it go and, and that. So the, the, the buzzy ones, the electrocutors are good for like dock areas. So you can put those in there, but if it's anywhere close to a food processing site, um, I definitely recommend the gummy ones. Okay. Um, is pouring hot water on drains, uh, can it kill, eliminate small flies? That's Joshua. Nope. Nope. Sorry. Cause it, it's not going to get into the gunk. It's, you know, it'll kill a little bit that maybe on the surface of the gunk, but you've still got all the rest of it where those larvae are. So no, it's not going to work. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Let's have a look. Uh, okay. A question from Yara is foaming cleaning safe in food handling areas. Again, you need to pick something that is, that is okay for your area. Okay. Um, question from Ligil. Um, how to control silverfish insects? 
Hey, we're supposed to be talking about small flies and large flies. Oh. Um, silverfish, again, are looking for kind of those moist environments. So if you can dry it out a little, and again, exclusion, typically they're going to be, they, they got in from the outside. So try and dry out the area, go for exclusion. Okay. Uh, Martin, <clears throat> uh, is the fly trap considered a physical risk component for a packing facility certified with HACCP? It shouldn't be um, it, unless you have it placed incorrectly. Mm. Um, it, it should not be a physical. The, the physical risk is the insects. So I'm, I'm saying no on that. Okay. Um, question from Yoga. Uh, have lots of rogerants on ILT, but cannot find a source. Can you assist? Yeah, likely coming from outside. And again, if they're the winged ones, you know, that colony is nice and healthy. So it for that particular ILT, where's the closest doorway? Just seal up that closest doorway really, really well and then try and inspect outside. OK, question from Abdul Rah Rahman. Um, can you please um, explain the best places for fly, fly killers? Yeah, I call it the Goldilocks zone. So you typically want it near an opening. Think of a, a personnel door or a dock door, you know, something that, that's going to open and close and may not be sealed all that well. But you don't want it too close to the door that it will draw stuff in from the outside. So you do want it about eye level. Um, so in my case, you know, two, two and a half meters. I'm, I'm a little short, but um, you want it about eye level because that's where they're flying. And I'd say... You know, if you can, around uh, two meters, six feet from from the door. Um, so that way, anything getting in, it's still close enough to capture them soon after they get in, but it's not close enough to the door to draw them in. So Goldilocks zone. Okay. Uh, question from NK. Uh, is there an action limit for the number of flies in a manufacturing site? Absolutely. It's the limit that you set. Okay. Um, and, oh, it's not a question, but from Ursula. Shell, I always learn something new from you, and thank you for that. That's nice, isn't it? Uh, I think I've actually managed to pick up through all of the questions. Uh, nice. Months, months, uh, Perez, uh, just to clarify on the potential risk of for foreign body contamination, I think this is mainly coming from electric fly killers if placed on top or next to production yeah. lines. The death of an electrocuted fly can end up in your production line. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Not, pre not a pretty sight when they explode, is it really? <laughs> Wing wings and legs and antennas or whatever they've got everywhere. Um, okay. Uh, I have another question. Um, from Alta, how do we control hmm. fruit flies in the commissary? So again, light traps may be a good option to find out where, which regions they're coming from or the most common in. Check your drains, check your fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, if you have soda machines, soda machines are a big one because those never get cleaned out. Um, so check those soda machines, ice makers, if you have an ice maker, because you've got all that that wet material and the drainage of the, the ice coming out. So check those wet, moist areas and start working your way out from there. OK, and a question from Mohammed. Uh, to monitor flies, shall we count the deads? in the fly traps yep yeah so the electric the the buzzer traps the electrocution traps uh usually have a little tray down below so you can pick through that and find out um if you're using the the gummy method i'm using those forever i love the gummy method and the buzzing method is so cool <laughs> uh if you're using a glue board one you can obviously easily count what's on there because it's stuck to it so yes brilliant i think unless you can see any more i think that's it All so right. we've gone yeah, we've gone five minutes over, but it was worth it. Uh, I think so, everybody. So, as usual, super presentation, great presentation style, uh, as well as content. Uh, so, two tens there, and the ten for the audience for the great questions. Yeah, another, thank you. 
and another 10 for the answers. Yeah, well, I do my best. And yeah. again, you folks can reach me on LinkedIn. You can email me, get me through my website. I'm happy to discuss more and answer any more questions that may not have gotten answered. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Shell. Hope to see you soon. I'll be in touch. Right. Bye, yeah. folks. Bye bye. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to just put your certificate in the sidebar now. Uh, you can go and grab that. Click the download now button. It'll open a new window uh, that you can save that image. Uh, it's a PNG image certificate. You can print and sign it yourself or you can open it in an image editing software and type it if you so wish. Um, and I'll claim a 6.5 out of 10 for my performance today uh, and leave room for improvement. But it's the first one back after, a, like I say, a bit of a hiatus over the summer. And we'll be bringing you lots more webinars soon. So for now, enjoy the rest of your Friday and uh, have a lovely weekend. Speak soon. Bye-bye.